Today is April the 19th, 2016. My name is Tanya Fincham, and along with me is Dr. Charles Abramson. And we are in the boardroom, I suppose. Yep, conference room. Con conference room of the president of Oklahoma State University to speak with Gary Clark, who is the senior vice president and general counsel. Did I get that right? That's right. <laughs> All right, thank you for having us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. Let's learn a little bit about you, beginning with when and where you were born. Okay. I was born March 4th, 1947, uh, in a little shotgun house on the banks of Crooked Creek in Marion County, Arkansas. Crooked Creek. Yeah. I claim Flippin. It was the closest uh, town of about 400. Uh, that was my birthplace, I guess. Uh, but, but it actually was out, out in the rural part of the state. I was you know, delivered at home by a doctor who charged, I think it was $10 for the delivery. So things have changed a little over the years. And what did your parents do for a living? Uh, kind of farming and um, and a little bit of uh, you know fishing and whatnot, and that sort of thing. My uh, parents were divorced when I was only a year and a half old, so uh, my mom moved out here to Oklahoma at that time and, and uh, raised me uh, by herself uh, for a while and then uh, she remarried when I was in the second grade and uh, we moved to a little town called Morris in Oklahoma and that's where I really spent the rest of my uh, high school, you know, grade school and high school years before coming to OSU. And did you have brothers and sisters? I did. I have uh, a sister and two brothers. So you're the oldest of them? Yes. They're, uh, my sister is eight years younger, 10, and then 12 years younger, so I'm quite a bit older. <laughs> yeah, they didn't like me as a babysitter too much. <laughs> a little too strict for them. <laughs> I don't think I ever beat over anything like that, but uh, I was pretty much sitting in that chair and <laughs> be quiet. <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, they probably could talk to you about quite a bit. Oh, well, where did you go to elementary school? Well, I, uh, I guess I started out at a little grade school, Emerson in Okmulgee, and then went to Franklin uh, in second grade, and then in third grade I went to we, Morris uh, Elementary School. And then high school? High school at Morris High School. And graduated in what year? Graduated in 1965. Okay. So, you know, the, the book and the movie, Whatever Happened to the Class of 1965, that was, I'm one of them. <laughs> Did you have a favorite subject? Uh, you know, I liked uh, pretty much, I liked school, uh, but probably the, the class that made the most difference for me was uh, the, what was then called vocational agriculture, now agricultural education. Uh, I mean, I liked English, I liked math, uh, so I, I really did like school. Were you in FFA or 4-H? I was in FFA. I had the good fortune uh, to be elected state FFA reporter. Uh, and serve in that capacity, which was a great experience for me. Favorite teacher? Well, Mr. Bearden, the, the ag teacher, and I, uh, you know, I, I felt like he uh, changed my life uh, in a very significant way, and uh, so I decided to be an ag teacher myself. And when I came, that's how I came to OSU uh, to study uh, agricultural education and got my bachelor's degree and. I uh, taught school for one year in uh, Laverne, Oklahoma. Uh, then I got drafted. I'm just telling you my life story here. That's, that's okay. Sure. All right. Well, um, got drafted into the Army and spent uh, some time uh, in the Army. I, it was during the Vietnam era, but uh, I was, I guess you might say, one of the lucky people who, instead of going to Vietnam, I went to Germany. And, uh, you know, other than me in the Army, uh, I, we had a good time, my wife. I was married by then, and, and uh, we got to travel throughout uh, you know, Europe uh, while, while I was there. Uh, we did Europe on $5 a day, literally, and uh, but really did enjoy that. And, uh, but then my job in the Army was law-related, and so I decided I might want to go to law school uh, when I got out and use a GI Bill to do that. And I, uh, but to get out of the Army early, they had a program that you could get out of six months early if you were going to school or had seasonal employment. And so I came back and did my master's degree in the spring of 72 and summer of 72. So I got my master's degree just before starting law school. From here? From here at OSU, absolutely, yeah. Because I thought, you know, it might not work out, but I might as well be prepared. 
uh, to go back. And I really enjoyed uh, teaching uh, the, uh, the kids in uh, that Ag Ed class and, and the FFA uh, deal. But, uh, you know, my wife was a city girl, and this, you know, uh, the long nights and, you know, going to the uh, show, showing livestock and spending a lot of time uh, doing those things was, uh, she, she wasn't quite ready for that, and especially in a really small town. So, uh, kind of, we I think jointly decided that well, uh, you know, this well, this was before I went into the army that well maybe it's not to be thinking about another career, but I wasn't sure what I didn't have any idea about law school at that point, so it just was my job in the army that was law related. Well, Morris is where close to Omaha. Yeah, it's about seven miles east of Omaha. So when you came to OSU. Mm -hmm. Did you come by yourself? Did your mother bring you a drop in? <laughs> no, I had a car that I paid $120 for. Um, and uh, there was another fellow from Morris that came to study agricultural education also. And we roomed together uh, as freshmen. Uh, a little cottage uh, in the middle of a block. Uh, I don't know if it's, I forgot what the address was, but it was about uh, Maybe a little more than a little more than half the size of this uh, baby, but it wasn't very big. Uh, and uh, we lived there our freshman year, and then we both pledged a fraternity here on campus, moved into it, and, and lived there for the rest of our uh, college career. And do you want to name the fraternity? Well, I, I'm very proud to Alpha Gamma Rho. Uh, was, that was another you know, wonderful, lady. yeah, very. Uh, Great experience, and the, you know the people there uh, really took me under the wings. And you know the difference between my freshman year here, and I worked for the football team, by the way, and uh, that was a you know great experience. But uh, you know, I the, other than the guys on the football team who I didn't really spend time after practices and all that, uh, you know, it was my friend from Morris and me, and he would go home on almost every weekend. So I spent a lot of weekends in the reading room or the browsing room of the library. Uh, you know reading books and, and uh, such, so, uh, but I didn't have much of a social life. And then moving into the fraternity, you know, I just changed dramatically. You had, you know, uh, probably 65, you know, people that you knew really well, and then you, you know, had somebody, some, I played a lot of basketball uh, and that sort of thing with, uh, so I didn't necessarily study maybe as much as I should have, but, uh, but I really, I, I'd say it was a, a great time and, and uh, got me active on campus doing things and, and that, was, that made a big difference for me from a you know, leadership skill development and all. And you met your wife here on campus? I did. Yeah, the, you know, another story with that, I don't know how much film you've got here, how much time you want to take, but we, we first met uh, in a um, committee meeting of what was then called Campus Chest. It was it's what's now called United Way, you know, it was, had Community Chest, and that's become United Way, and they call it Campus Chest for the, uh, the college campus. And uh, the meeting, my recollection, it was about 6.30 in the morning, 6.37, it was an early morning meeting. And uh, I guess I was wearing uh, blue jeans and had a, you know, kind of the old rodeo medallion uh, buckle and a, maybe a white shirt or something. But I walked in and, you know, Jane was there and I didn't particularly even notice her, but she said, she looked around the room and said, well, there's nobody in here I'm interested in. So I didn't get off to the, I didn't make the best first impression apparently. But uh, we, uh, and we actually didn't uh, date for a while. It was, this a little, uh, maybe if you don't show this to my wife, I'll just tell another <laughs> embarrassing story. Uh, but we, I, we were both at the some, uh, some party on campus. I don't remember what it was, but she was with another guy. She just didn't look like she was. I, by then, I knew her from working on this committee. And I thought, oh goodness, you know, she just didn't seem to be having any fun. I feel a little sorry for her. And a girl that I wanted to ask for uh, to another uh, an AGR Christmas party. Uh, and she wasn't available to come, and so I thought, well, you know, Jane, I, you know, I'll just invite her. So I invited her, and really, I don't think I ever dated the other girl again. I think we just kind of went on, went on from there. Uh, so you never know about those things. And did you get married before you finished? Before no, you finished? Um, we married after I got my draft notice. Uh, I was in Laverne teaching, and uh, when I got my draft notice, uh, you know, we had 
be kind of become engaged, but we really, you know, we we're planning on waiting until the end of the year after she finished. She's a year behind me, so we were planning on waiting until she graduated. But when I got my draft notice and I was going to be uh, going into the army, she said, "Well, why don't we move up, you know, her wedding date to January 30th?" And so uh, we did that, and she came out to Laverne, was there for, you know, that four or five months before I, they let me defer my actual entry until the actually end of the school year so I could finish up the school year. And so that's kind of what we did. Was she in sor a sorority? Yeah, she's a Tridelt. And yeah, in fact, she's now, the, she's been the president of their alum, or I guess they call it house corporation for several years now. So she's been pretty involved with them. Well, when you got engaged, did they do any kind of traditional recognition of that? Yeah, they, you know, and, and some of this is more based on her memories than mine, probably, but uh, when, uh, we, didn't, we didn't get pinned, you know, back then you had, you, know, you could drop, pin, you know, kind of levels of series of dropped, pinned, engaged. So uh, we didn't get dropped or pinned, and so, it was, you know, they, they give it, and now said, okay, somebody's been engaged, and she was president of the Tridell House uh, at the time. So somebody had been engaged, and they passed, I think they passed something around, and when she takes it, everything she said, everybody was just shocked and so surprised. Well, you, know, you, you're not even pinned, you know. So, anyway, so I think she enjoyed kind of surprising everybody. Yeah. Well, do you remember anything about homecoming? Your, well, your, your yeah, we, um, the HRs had not, I don't know, they may have participated in homecoming in the past, but we, uh, and I can't tell you for sure what year this was, but the first time that we participated in homecoming, and I can't remember if it was my junior or senior year, but we did what we called the cow. And we had a, we basically, one of our members' mom was an, an artist, and she would go to fairs around the, the country and paint uh, dairy cattle, you know, winning dairy cattle. And so she gave us the plan for a, you know, a, a scaled up cow that we built out of wood, you know, just two befores and chicken wire and all that, and set Pistol Pete under and milking, you know, doing just like this, you know. So uh, we didn't win any of the uh, official awards, but we got the people's choice. You know, we had a lot of people who came by and said, you know, you, you guys should have won. You guys should have won. So we took up. Yeah, we enjoyed that. So we had a lot of fun, and really kind of started tradition. I mean, the AGRs now are uh, tough to beat in the homecoming, uh, in home engineering especially. But we got a lot of guys who could weld, and you know, grew up on the farm, and you know, piece things together and make them work. And so, uh, yeah, that was all a great experience. Well, did you have to work your way through college? I did. did uh, yeah. Well, I was very fortunate to get scholarships. Uh, my parents, you know, like I say, there were three kids at home. Uh, they really couldn't help uh, at all. So uh, I worked at a variety of jobs. Worked at the library uh, one of the uh, part of the time, and uh, different, like I say, just different things uh, along the way. And. Uh, you know, certainly summer jobs, and instead of going spring break, going anywhere, I'd go back home and work, uh, you know, finding some kind of job to do. What did you do in the library? Uh, basically, we shelved books and such. I, I was uh, in the kind of the technical area, science and all that, and then also back, I remember, back some of the first copy machines that actually had, uh, you know, paper instead of that old, whatever, they threw a fax stuff. Uh, you know, a roll of paper, so I would you know, clean the platen and, and put a roll of paper in and all that sort of thing. So I got, got pretty good at that uh, before I was through. Well, when you graduated, did your parents come out for the, the ceremony? Sure. Did they? Yeah. And where was it? Do you remember? Well, in my case, it was in uh, Lewis, on Lewis, Lewis Stadium, I guess they called it at the time. Lewis, uh, you know, so we were outside sitting there and they just said, would the uh, members of the College of Agriculture stand up, you know, stay on your graduate? So it wasn't, we didn't go across the marching across the stage like they do now. And when you came back for your master's, where did you live? Uh, five, twelve and a half Southwest Street. I remember that. Um, it's, you, it's still there, and looks about the same, even uh, forty years or so later. Uh, but there was like I think there were about four apartments in that building. And uh, we just stayed in uh, that. 
then we did also, I guess, and move to uh, uh, the married student housing, you know, the block, but the center block deals and shit said that. That was the nicest place we'd lived since she'd been married. So I don't know if people would say that now, but that's, that's uh, she felt like we'd made, made a big step up. What did, did you bowl in the bowling alley in the student union? <laughs> I did. Yeah, I remember that well and played pool uh, in the basement. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, things are a little different now. A little. <laughs> Do you have a favorite spot? Uh, you know, my favorite spot on campus is the uh, balcony there on the west side of the Student Union. Uh, right look, overlooking the formal gardens and looking up the library. Uh, yeah, it's just a beautiful place. We call it a balcony porch, you know, what? that, that, that area where that kind of uh, Rounded that looks looks out over the formal gardens. That's clearly my favorite spot. Okay, so once you finish with your master's, take us through your career until you came back to OSU. Um, well, after finishing my master's, I uh, went to the University of Texas Law School for three years. Uh, after my second year there, I clerked for a firm in Tulsa. Uh, called Connor and Winters, which was at that time the largest firm in Tulsa. Like they had about 24 lawyers. And uh, when I finished the summer, they just kind of said, "Well, we really liked you, but we're not sure. You know, we're going to be making it offers, or you know, we're going to be looking at some other people, interviewing some other people, and you know, we'll get back to you." <laughs> so, I thought, okay, well, I can't be, I can't count on this deal. I better be looking. So I uh, interviewed with. Uh, Crow and Dunleavy, I interviewed over the phone. I'd sent them some stuff and I got a call and really you know, quite a bit of encouragement from them about the job with their in their Oklahoma City office, but I really preferred Tulsa. And then I also uh, did get a job, job offer from a firm, uh, Dorner Saunders, Stuart Anderson, and I can't think of the rest, but and Connor Winters was, had more names too. but. Uh, but I did find I did get the offer from Connor Winters, and, and since I knew all those people, it was I mean I really liked both firms very well. But I ended up going with uh, Connor Winters, so I started the job there at fourteen thousand four hundred a month. At a, and now you know starting salaries are probably in excess of a hundred thousand dollars for associates. So it tells you how long it's been. But I uh, and you know started out as an associate. You know you kind of do. You know, whatever research projects and drafting projects, everything that you need to do, and you know as you go along, you get more responsibility. And I made partner uh, you know, after six years, uh, which was uh, kind of the standard time. And then uh, about a year later, uh, there were five of us young uh, whippersnappers that said, you know, maybe uh, we might like to go out on you know, on our own and and you know take our chances. And you know, not having really any clients to the camp on or anything else, uh, really. Uh, so because most of the work that you did, you know, in a large firm, you know, you got partners who bring in the clients and give work to associates. And so uh, I was a little nervous. I even said to my uh, new partners that, well, look, if it gets bad enough, will it embarrass you if I, you know, take a night job welding or something? So they all said, no, that you know, that'd be fine. But it never got that bad. So. Uh, but we uh, had our firm. You know, it was a you know, great uh, deal called Baker, Oster, McSpadden, Clark, and Razor. And uh, we uh, built that, you know, the firm kept growing, you know, very successful and really a, just a jewel of a group of people. You know, the lawyers, associate, all the staff. We had a great office manager who made sure we hired, you know, she would often say, you know, if we were hiring you know, someone, if I'm primarily uh, probably women that she'd be interviewing uh, for secretarial positions and that sort of thing, and uh, she said, well, she just wasn't Baker Hoster material. And so she had the high standards that uh, she insisted upon, and, and as a consequence, we had just you know fabulous uh, assistance. And uh, but after a period of time, we kind of decided that for 16 years, I guess I should say. We decided that you know there wasn't uh, probably a good future. Most of the we did a lot of banking work, and most of the banks were merging, and they were you know just getting fewer and fewer, bigger and bigger, and associated with banks out of Oklahoma. And we decided well we need to really be 
thinking about this because this doesn't look good for us. So we and we were approached, just uh, kind of coincidentally approached by another firm to uh, merge with them, and, and there was an Oklahoma City oriented firm that wanted to get a Tulsa office. That had, actually had a few people in it, and you know, we thought about it and talked about it and everything. We said, you know, the, the you know, it, we think merger makes a great deal of sense, but the, this particular firm, we don't really add to them. We kind of stack on you know, their strengths. We're not really doesn't uh, give it. There's not any hybridization or you know any real additive uh, effect that we think there ought to be, and, and we don't think it'd be that good for them or us. So we started thinking about it and said, well, really, Crow and Dunleavy, which had started an office in Tulsa by then, was really the, seemed to us to be the perfect match. And we were kind of surprised that they hadn't even at least made a pass at us because they you know, knew us fairly well and everything. And so we dispatched one of our partners to meet with one of their partners for lunch. And, and basically, this was in uh, December of uh, 1996, I guess. And you know, in, in the conversation, basically, the other guy says, "You know, God, we never even thought that you guys would consider this. We would love to have you." And by the first of February, we were in the firm. I mean, it happened that quickly. So, uh, so from 1997 uh, until 2004, I, I was with them, and I primarily did, um, you know, business things, estate planning, primarily probate, trust work, and that sort of thing. I've done oil and gas and other things over the course of my career. But uh, so, and then in 2004, uh, I was uh, contacted to say, you know, would, you know, would you be interested in the general counsel position at the Oklahoma State University Foundation? And I said, well, yeah, I would be actually. Because uh, by then, I, I hadn't mentioned this, I guess, but in 1993, I was appointed to the Board of Regents and so I really had kind of reconnected to OSU and you know, really felt like that this was something that I was you know, uh, passionate about, I guess. And so uh, eventually in June, I started June 1st of 2004 at the OSU Foundation as general, Vice President General Counsel and uh, did that for several years until uh, my current jewel, the president, said, well, uh, Burns Hargis is going to call you to say, ask if you'll come over and work with him after when he was selected to be president of OSU uh, in December, and he couldn't start until the, the legislature made a, a changed the law to allow him to come early. There it was a law. The law was that you had to be at least a year out of a, being a, a uh, regent, and he had resigned from the board I think in July of 2007. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so he asked if I would, you know, uh, and Burns called and said, would you uh, consider that? And I said, well, let me talk to you about it. And I know in my own mind, I was actually thinking, well, I don't see myself as being a bureaucrat. You know, I'm really, I enjoy what I'm doing. I mean, I really like my job and the people there at the foundation and what they were doing and all. But, uh, so I said I'd meet with Burns, but actually I think at the time I was thinking I'm going to probably say, well, gee, this is nice, but, you know, and part of it I'd seen how uh, President Smidley had used uh, General Goodberry, and it was primarily that he was just always with him and kind of carrying his briefcase and driving, his, driving him and all that, and I just didn't feel like I could be additive by doing that. I just, you know, just a lot of people could do that job. But Burns, you know, we talked two times for probably two and a half hours apiece, and by the end of that time, I was as excited about what I thought he was going to do at OSU, uh, and that I, he thought I could help him, and he, and how he at least expressed to me was, you know, he needed to be out on the road, you know, raising money, and you know, be out. He needed somebody here to help keep things moving, and that you know, he could, uh, you know, kind of assign job, you know, here do this, do that, and, and get it done. And in effect, be you know, be be separate. And so, uh, like I say, by then I was uh, absolutely ready to say yes. And actually, if anything, it's been better than I would have expected. Had your all's paths crossed before then? You know, uh, just very little. Um, you know, he uh, I knew about him for you know probably two reasons. Two of my well, actually three of my partners were very active in when the Penn Square Bank. Uh, failure occurred in 1982 
and we had three lawyers who spent most of the time in Oklahoma City working on different problems there. And Burns was also in very heavily involved with representing the uh, uh, over the currency, I guess, but anyway, basically closing banks and you know, dealing with problems with banks. So they, I knew, and, you know, they, and they talked about him and what a good lawyer he was and that sort of thing. And then, of course, he had the, the uh, program uh, on TV, Flashpoint, that I watched. And every day as I drive to work, uh, not every day, but I think it was on Thursdays, there was a segment with uh, Turpin and, and Hargis, you know, that, you know, that are in their band back and forth. So I felt it way like I knew him, but and he didn't really know me personally. I think really probably uh, one of the things that may have led him to call me was, you know, my involvement with the uh, acquisition of the properties in the Athletic Village area. I did all the negotiations to, to acquire those properties and, you know, I think he felt like, okay, here's somebody who can, well, one, I, you know, we had, a, there were a lot of problems initially when we had a, a firm, an easement uh, firm, and they were just running roughshod over people and, you know, it was not going well. So we took them out of the equation and I took over. And so, you know, the things calmed down and, and we got it done. Uh, so I think he thought, okay, well, here's someone who can be diplomatic and you know, be a problem solver. Now, that's just my interpretation. I don't know what his interpretation is, but that's uh, Sounds so mine. Yeah, well, that makes me feel good anyway. <laughs> I was trying to think. He was on campus the same time, or roughly the same time you were as the undergrads. Yes, almost, yeah. Almost. He was a little bit ahead of me. But you didn't know but each other? we didn't know then. each other then. I mean, I, I've thought about it. And I, thought, yeah, I don't remember. We, you know, obviously AGRs and Sigma News or houses are right by one another. I probably might have seen him, you know, around campus and such, but I really don't remember that. We may have been in Blue Key together. Uh, so I, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I just I, honestly, and he doesn't have any recollection of me either. So I don't feel too bad. Well, at that time, the, the campus didn't have Phi Beta Kappa when That's you were when you were no, there. no, it didn't. No. Do you recall when you first got involved with with that initiative? With Phi Beta Kappa? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, that was something Burns, when we first came to campus, I mean, they, that was one of his goals, was to uh, make the effort to get a Phi Beta Kappa chapter on campus. So, um, you know, the efforts had been unsuccessful in the past. Uh, we had, I don't know, you may have mentioned it when you interviewed him, we, we had even had a professor who would, you know, apparently write and say OSU doesn't deserve a chapter, uh, which is hard to imagine. Uh, to me, I don't know why I would be teaching at a university that wasn't good enough to have a Phi Beta Kappa chapter. But uh, and we knew both knew better. We, you know, we had some tremendous students who, in my opinion, were robbed of the opportunity to be in Phi Beta Kappa. And even though I'm an ag, I was an ag major and you know, I wasn't eligible or anything of that for Phi Beta Kappa, but I had a you know, very high opinion of uh, Phi Beta Kappa and still do. I mean, it's a, a tremendous organization and uh, you know, we're, uh, I'm just tickled to death that we finally got what I think OSU, OSU deserved and what these students deserve. Well, when, how, how early on had you been aware that that even existed, that the society itself, Phi Beta Kappa? I mean, you wouldn't have known about it probably when you were here no. as an undergrad. Um, well, I, I think I did, or, you know, recently, rec you, know, you, uh, you know, see movies, you know, about, you know, talk about Phi Beta Kappa yeah. and that sort of thing. And so uh, I realized that was, you know, it's a very significant accomplishment to be selected for Phi Beta Kappa. And what was your role in particular? Well, I acted somewhat as an intermediary, I guess, uh, of sorts, uh, in uh, trying to help facilitate uh, making, you know, making the progress. Obviously, we had uh, a number of people who were involved in, in, in different ways, um, you know, and Perry Geffner uh, involved in, you know, in getting the application and all that. You, Chuck, and or Charles had uh, played a role there. Uh, uh, Bob Grawlman, uh, you know, there were a number of people who were engaged in trying to, you know, pr tell OSU's story and in a way that uh, is meaningful and I think, you know, that, that did a good job and then of course we had a group of uh, a committee that came in and visited uh, OSU and so that's really when I was probably most involved was trying to help uh, work 
with you know, helping to get some of the arrangements made through uh, especially my assistant, uh, Melissa Meredith, who did really the legwork. I tried to help make sure that we were getting all those things done and getting uh, some of the you know, things printed, make sure we uh, had all the arrangements in a way that you know, put us in, in our best light, I guess, so that we, we wanted to be successful. You don't get a chance very often. And uh, we were one of uh, three, I think, in the year we were. And I think they say that you know, roughly uh, you know, about a third of those who apply are accepted. And so we felt like we'd been denied long enough and that it's time to you know, be successful. I think President Hargis had mentioned that the air conditioning was out in the hotel. It was. And I have God was calling over there to say, we've got to do something. And they managed to get window units for those five, uh, or I think those five rooms. <laughs> so we were willing to pull out all the stops. Yeah, you know, it was a real you know, a tense moment there for a bit. And if they had been turned down this time, do you think we would have gone again? Oh, I'm sure. Well, you know, you, uh, I don't think, I don't remember now what they say about it, but, you know, you have to wait a while before you get another opportunity. And uh, I think really, I don't know, it probably goes back 30 years that OSU had been applying. So it was you know, quite a lengthy time. So, uh, but I'm an optimist at heart and I'm, you know, persistent too in that, I think. Uh, and we had a good story. I mean, we had, you know, uh, we just deserved, I mean, we should have had a chapter a long time before. We just hadn't done a good job of telling our story, in my opinion. And so when you told the story, I mean, we were, uh, the, the visiting committee was very complimentary of uh, OSU. I mean, it wasn't like, well, you guys barely scraped by. I mean, they were very complimentary of, of uh, OSU and, and the visit and everything else. So uh, they didn't tell us what the, you know, what, what they, in fact, I guess, you know, it has to be voted on at the National Triennium, so they can't tell you that you're in, but, I mean, they were beaming from year to year and when they left, and, and so we, you know, sent, certainly sent a good message. And that was the first time they made it that far, too, wasn't it? Just the yes. first time? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so it was, um, like I say, it, it was all, all, the, all the marbles on the line. We wanted, wanted to make sure that we uh, managed to bring it home. Well, were you in Florida when they met to decide? No, I didn't uh, go down. Bob Grauman yeah, was there, I know, with along with Perry, and, and certainly the president was there, um, and that was that was a, you know, a big moment. But I, yeah, like I say, generally speaking, you know, with the president on the road, I try to be around uh, here so that if something comes up, I can uh, you know, either uh, it's. I know in my mind, you know, this is what Burns would do, you know, what he'd want to do. I usually, you know, I can have the authority to kind of say, okay, let's do this. But if it's something that I'm not uh, real sure of, then I try to condense the information. Here's what you need to know and what, what do you want to do so that I can, you know, with a phone call, we can get there. Well, who called and told you the news? Um, you know, I, I think it was Burns, actually, that sent the, uh, an email. Uh, that, you know, kind of letting us know that was uh, uh, the good news. I'd say it was, uh, wasn't a surprise really. I mean, I expected us to be successful, but but it was nice to know. And there was some hooping and hovering, I'm sure. I'd say that you do your happy dance. <laughs> yeah, if I could dance, I probably would have. <laughs> but if I did the equivalent anyway. Yeah, that was, uh, that was a big, big moment and, um, you know, we're, or at least for my, like I said, I, it's, it was something that we owed the students of OSU. Uh, I regret we can't do anything about the students who've come before and should have been in Phi Beta Kappa and didn't get that opportunity. Like I say, I think that was, a, they were robbed of something that they uh, shouldn't have been. But at least now we have it. And, and now what we make, try to make sure is that every, because we don't have that history of Phi Beta Kappa here on campus that you know, a lot of students don't understand mm -hmm. you know, what its significance is, uh, like we did. Um, but, uh, you know, so right now we're in the midst of um, you know, working <laughs> to help recruit uh, students who've been selected for membership to make sure they don't pass up the opportunity. So we're at, I think we have 26 out of 33 who have uh, registered. And so we got seven more though that we uh, want to get signed up.
Between now and when? Then? Uh, between now and the, well, the 22nd is when they get in the program, but uh, there we got some, our, their advisors are working. Um, we had one student who's in China, and <laughs> we had to kind of get an email across. So actually, when I say 26, that was actually as of last Friday, so we may, well, I'm sure we're above that now. Is that about average, 25 yeah, to 30? Yeah, largest class yeah, well, last year we didn't have a very good turnout, so I just, I mean, I said, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, we're going to get after them and kind of make sure. Important. One of the things that we've done differently this year uh, is that the chapter is paying their initiation fee, and there are no annual dues, so I can say, look, there is no downside to this. I mean, you know, you may not have ever heard of Phi Beta Kappa, but I promise you, a lot of people out there who you're going to be talking to, interviewing that at my age, know very well what Phi Beta Kappa means. And they're, you know, and so this is something that is meaningful. They get inundated with a lot of other offers, you know, to join this fraternity or that sorority or, you know, whatever that don't really mean anything. And so they just tend to lump them all together. And so what we're trying to do is uh, get people, you know, the president hosted a uh, reception at his house to invite all of them to come to talk about how important it was. And I, I quizzed every one of them, every one of those guys was already registered, and so we, we were already good on those, but, uh, and so we're just, like I say, we're trying to finish up and get make sure so that I think with a little bit of time, people are going to understand that this is like mortarboard or blue key, or you know, this is something to you know, wow, if you get there, that's that's an accomplishment. It's like the third year, maybe that you third year, yeah. This is our third class. We did have now, and again, this was because uh, one of our regent's daughter came to uh, you know, attended OSU, and and I uh, kind of encouraged her to go in, you know, in the honors program. and. I mean, and every time you talk to me, you say, oh, that was the greatest thing, Gary. I just really can't thank you enough for you know, getting her involved, but she just flowered in that program. And uh, so we got the news that we got in the Phi Beta Kappa chapter, and we didn't get, uh, you know, we were installed in February of 13, and she was going to graduate in December, but she decided not to graduate, and so she could stay and be part of the first class of Phi Beta Kappa. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. But, I mean, that was out, you know, but her dad was you know, uh, from Duke University and knew very well what Phi Beta Kappa was. And, you know, and so, and, you know, so she was already primed and ready and, and actually changed, changed her plans so that she could uh, be a Phi Beta Kappa. So maybe it's the parents that need to be educated. Well, it is. You know, and that's, the problem is that I think a lot of these kids, you know, they get this information here at school and their parents never know uh, about that. So, you know, it's tempting to write a letter to the parents that says, you need to call your child and tell them to sign up. <laughs> but, uh, well, like I said, what we want to do is get the reputation established so that everybody on campus understands that, how significant this is. And, and uh, so we're making, I think we're making head, good headway on that. And did they make you an honorary member? They did, they, they call a foundation member and so an ag, I don't mean there are too many ag majors in it that are, uh, uh, that there were six, they, when a new, a new chapter is installed, uh, up to six people can be named as foundation members. And so I was thrilled to be included uh, among those. Uh, President Hargis was, uh, we have a Dean Stringer who was on the Board of Regents and uh, been, after wanting to a Phi Beta Kappa chapter here for 50 plus years, you know, and he would have been a member. He went to Harvard Law School, very bright guy. Uh, so uh, we had the associate dean for arts and sciences, uh, Trish Houston, who donated some money to create a, an English scholarship that uh, or uh, professorship that was helpful in our application. You know, to uh, show a you know, an interest in the humanities and, and all. So it was a, a great group of people. Like I say, I was flattered and, and uh, probably, like I say, don't, don't necessarily deserve it, but I am very, I was very pleased and I became my, and the, um, the certificate and the key are hanging in my office right now. That's going to be my next question. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> I'd say I'm very proud of it, even though I, uh, like I say, I didn't earn it uh, in, in the usual way. I, 
I'm very proud to have that opportunity. Well, did you have a foreign language in, in your undergrad? No, I didn't. I had a foreign language, uh, French, in high school, but uh, so it wasn't a requirement in ag, as you might expect. We had to learn to talk barnyard, I guess, but, <laughs> but not any of the accepted languages. But I, but I did. I graduated uh, uh, in the top percentages of the class here and all, so I, I, academically I would have been qualified. I didn't have the uh, arts and science. It was kind of funny, Mike, you had a humanities professor. In fact, I was just thinking about him a few days ago and wondering where he is now and what he's doing. But, you know, he kept saying, you're an ag major? Uh, because, I mean, I really enjoy reading, as I mentioned earlier, and, and, uh, and we were lucky. He, uh, at that time, they were doing selected readings from about 15 books over a semester, you know, for that in introductory humanities class. And in, in our case, he says, well, instead of doing that, I, if you guys agree, I'd rather just read uh, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. And then, you know, we do the whole class you know, on that one book. So, uh, and I, you know, it was a fascinating book, I thought, and, you know, and really getting into that uh, psychology of it all and, you know, and kind of a detective story and, a, and how, uh, you know, a person's uh, guilt and uh, enter into it, so I remember it still very well. Do you have children? I do. I've did, got two children. Did they come to LSU? Well, one did, and one went to the University of Texas uh, and stayed stayed in Austin. Uh, he's been there, and then one came to OSU and uh, is now an intensive care nurse in uh, Tulsa. So they're not necessarily in a program that they could get into five days. No, uh, my son was. Uh, he actually ended up getting, I guess, uh, he would have been a parts and letters type graduate. He was a geography, but it was really uh, for city planning type of things. Uh, and he works, he works for the city of Austin now. So, uh, yeah, so he, anyway, they were, uh, yeah, like I say, my, my daughter was a biological sciences major here at OSU, and so he could have been, I guess, I don't know that she had the foreign language requirements. I just I don't remember now. It was kind of funny. I asked her, how are you doing on your class? Well, we haven't gotten any grades back on our test. I said, well, you know, it's you know, past Thanksgiving. You'd think you'd have some back. No, no, we don't have any. Well, okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> so she didn't share much information, I guess, is the best way to put it. That happens a lot, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Nowadays, they're like to be independent. Well, did you participate in the first in the induction ceremony the, that they had yes. in Central? Yes, that was uh, very nicely done. It was nice to have uh, the uh, uh, national leadership here. John Churchill uh, was here and and uh, very nice gentleman. I guess he was just now retiring from the that what the position is called, but it's like general secretary or something. It's kind of an unusual uh, title that he's been. Uh, seems like a a fabulous personality, very uh, warm and, uh, and dignified and also. But. Well, going forward, where do you see this going, Phi Beta Kappa, yeah. and, and as far but as... I'm going to say, my, my hope and goal is, is that we get it to a point that people are clamoring to get in, and that once, when they're told you have been selected, that they are tickled pink and signing up immediately. So, and I think we'll get there, uh, you know, may not be, you know, within a year or two, but I think, you know, as, as the word trickles out, one of the problems we have is that, you know, they're seniors, so mostly, I mean, there are juniors who do get invited on occasion, but they're the, the qualifications are higher than they are for a senior, but, you know, when, when your seniors get notified and then they leave the campus immediately, there's really not much of a residual of people here to talk about sure. it. And so we have to find a way through advisors and others to really, you know, stoke up the, the understanding of what Phi Beta Kappa is. But I think I'm saying we're only three, we're still in our infancy, and so I feel confident that we'll get there. Have you been mostly males, or, or there is a mix of females and males? Oh my gosh, yeah, I'd say at least half females, I would think. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they're. Uh, it was interesting to me at the presence uh, reception. Uh, there were, I think, five math students, math and math uh, students, and of those, two or three were women. I mean, it wasn't uh, 
uh, but I'm just surprised. Like I say, there's so many in one area, and, and several of them were, <laughs> one was like math and political science. <laughs> you know, you think, how did that, you know, how did that happen? But uh, several double majors and all, but, and really a, a really uh, good group of people. I mean, you know, you know, they were very comfortable talking and, uh, you know, say, uh, just nice young people. Well, the reason I ask, the application process has been mostly males working toward pushing it forward. I mean, there's been a few females, but mostly, yeah, we mostly have, males. Yeah, that's true. But as far as the, like say, the selection, uh, you know, there was a group of people who are eligible, you know, right. it's based mm -hmm. strictly on, you know, objective criteria. And uh, like I say, I haven't really stopped to count, but I would, I think it's probably roughly 50-50. Uh, if I were guessing, just from looking at it, and uh, you know, it's like some areas, you know, in the vet med, you know, we've got something like eighty some percent of women you know, now, so you uh, you really can't tell uh, anymore kind of what people are going to be, you know, what their interests are, and uh, so um, yeah, I don't I don't see that as being uh, really an issue at all. Did they show you the secret handshake? <laughs> they probably did, but I don't remember it. It's actually on the website. <laughs> it's not so secret. How, how no, secret it is. <laughs> it's not the one that I was taught at Boston University. That was that right? Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, I give the the, uh, the speech at the commencement ceremony, so I won't this year, I won't be, I won't be here. And in that speech, it actually is mentioned the, the secret handshake. <laughs> but it's not the secret handshake that I learned at Boston University. Uh -huh. So it's changed. It's changed. Yeah. yeah. So maybe we should uh, have our own secret hand. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Can I do the, the add, some extra, add some extra things in or something? Yeah, uh, well, I haven't had to give the secret handshake, so I guess I'm okay so far. <laughs> well, I just uh, wanted to comment that I think it's rare that upper administration is really hoping in this, in this effort. And I don't think you see that in most, uh, most colleges and universities. So I'm going to give you a person to thank you. Because oh. I believe you make phone calls. Oh yeah, I've written uh, emails and phone calls. I even ran one guy down. I, I was at the arts and science banquet the other night, and, and one of the students who hadn't signed up yet was uh, being honored. Had been honored, so I read, you know, I saw him, and and I tried to call him and unsuccessfully. So I went over to his table and and, and called him and said, Hey, uh, you know, I've been trying to get a hold of you, and we need to get you signed up. And so. And he did sign up the next, you know, before the next morning. In fact, sent me an email to, uh, I actually, I've sent him, yeah, I said, just in case you can't find the other emails here, I'll send you one. And and then he called next morning and, and or not called, but responded by email saying that he had registered. So, uh, like I say, we'll track them down where we can. And like I say, right now, I'm working through Amy Martindale, who was the, you know, I guess she sort of supervises the advisors in the, Arts and Sciences, and so I got enlisted her help to get the advisors for each of the seven people who hadn't signed up. Well, actually six, because uh, I talked to I knew Lisa Mar uh, Mar uh, Mantini in math, so I got I called her about the student. That's the one who's in. The reason he hadn't gotten hold of him was he's in China, so she said, "But I'll get in touch with him and I'll make sure he gets signed up." So and that's so there were six others, and so. Amy was getting in touch with all those advisors so that, you know, they could call and contact them and say, hey, this is for real, you need to sign up. Personal touch. Yeah, so we're going to we'll track them down. Is there a, a minimum that you have to have in order to keep the chapter? I don't think that's true. I, I gather from uh, the, you know, what, I can't remember now, Perry, with, uh, Perry Gethner, who's our president of our the chapter, uh, says that the that nationally there is less you know there's not a hundred percent acceptance uh, and that's it's not unusual and he didn't talk about what what percentage is but uh, again I think it's that you know people don't have the same value don't value it the same as, as my generation and so that's probably that part of it well is it is it just each one semester a year or do you look at like, like those who graduated in in the summer and the fall, do you, or is it just the ones that are graduating in June? Yeah, well, if they're, I guess if they're a senior, so if they were going to be graduating, say, that next December, they could be considered this time, I think, 
and you know, the you know, the eligibility criteria, I think they run that you know, by computer. You know, say okay, give us all the people who fit these criteria, and so those I think would and then like I say, and even there are a handful of juniors. One of the guys who was selected again this year as a senior was selected last year as a junior and didn't accept. <laughs> so. He kind of, he was apologetic at the, because he was at this reception the other night, kind of, oh, well, you know, uh, but uh, anyway, so that was, that was kind of interesting. So we at least got him on the second pass. Well, at least he had a second try. Yeah, he did. Now, not, not very many juniors are eligible, though, so. Uh, and I believe we have the rule that uh, if you declined, you can still accept the winner. So that that will help also. Yeah. So somewhere you'll keep a running list of those that have been asked. Right. Well, it's one of those things. Like I say, it's you know they they've earned it, and you want to see them uh, get it. So it's not all about you know okay we're so exclusive that we you get you get thirty minutes to decide or something. <laughs> a couple of more years, maybe you won't have to. That's right. To, well, to that's, that. that's certainly the hope is that we get to a point that uh, that you know, students are. Actually, saying what does it take to be five in a cap? You know, what can I what can I do to earn that? Well, when you were back at Morris, did you ever think that you would be sitting here doing uh, this? Oh, not really. <laughs> Thought I'd be an ag teacher somewhere. Uh, so driving a tractor on the weekends? Probably, yeah. And yeah, I would. I certainly would have been. Uh, been fine with me as I said you know my teacher uh, changed my life and changed the lives of a number of other people and uh, so you know that there is uh, no amount of money that can uh, take place of that uh, you know I can say I, I will never be able to fully express you know how strongly I feel about my teacher I mean he was uh, terrific he, he took us all over the countryside uh, you know did everything he could to help us be successful and so that was, like I say, I thought, gee, uh, you know, you did it for just one person. And I don't know that I did. I had some good students. Uh, one of them, uh, one of the guys when I did my student teaching is now in, in charge of the FFA program for the state. Uh, another one uh, was an ag teacher here in Stillwater for a number of years, Billy Foote. And uh, Brad Ashball, another student, was an ag teacher. Uh, so you never know. Yes, or, you know what? Uh, where you figure in all the equation? I left an impression with at least a few. Then. Well, yeah, that or somebody else. <laughs> Who knows? We've been a cowboy for a long time. I you? have been, yeah, uh, and I'll always be a cowboy. Uh, yeah, I, I grew up a, a Sooner fan, but uh, because of my stepfather. But I, when I came to OSU, I, you know, it was I went 180 degrees. <laughs> Fortunately, the two years that I worked for the football team, we beat OU, and so I when the, the first time I you know just got a you know just an index card, and I did in as you know just as big letters as I could, wrote 17-16 and sent it to him, <laughs> and then the next year we beat him again. It was 15 to 14, and so I sent that to him. Unfortunately, the next year was like 42 to seven or something, and I got one. <laughs> So uh, that was a little, a little awkward, but yeah, so since, yeah, since the moment I came to OSU, actually probably before, because I listened uh, in 1965, the 64-65 basketball season, uh, uh, OSU won the Big Eight uh, championship, uh, regular season, I think they had a tournament back then. But I would listen to their, after I'd kind of decided to come to OSU, I'd listen to their games and you know, followed them on the radio. And so that's, I guess that's when I was probably my first time of being an OSU fan anyway. And did you go to games when you got here? I did. Football uh, and basketball? You know, pretty much everything, yeah. Even wrestling. wrestling. You know, in fact, I'd never, uh, I didn't know what college style wrestling was. Until coming to OSU, I don't know. You're too young to remember George George uh, Charles. May remember him, but anyway, he was you know professional wrestler, and you know the, all that fake stuff. And so, I hope I wasn't really all that think, interested in wrestling. But uh, gorgeous George. Yeah. He was gorgeous George. Yeah. <laughs> He'd be very flamboyant. His costume. Oh yeah, very flamboyant. That cape. 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You have to. You'd have to see it to believe it. But uh, anyway. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, I, so I, you know, wrestling, uh, I don't know, I guess I didn't really attract or tennis or some of those things or golf, but uh, but those sports and baseball, you know, some four sports that I... And then you were on the intramural teams for your... Oh yeah, yeah, you know, that basketball. was always fun, yeah. Like I say, it's a little embarrassing to admit, but I'd probably spend uh, on Saturdays probably eight hours of a Saturday playing basketball. <laughs> Most Saturdays, so. And your homework was done by the end. <laughs> yeah, I, like I say, I uh, I was a good student, uh, and so I didn't have to work at it really too hard. But so I, I played a lot of uh, basketball, and I was president of the TV club. So those are the things that my fraternity brother is still kidding me about. And were you in ROTC? No, I was the. I, the when I became when I was here as a freshman, that was the first year that ROTC was not required of uh, freshman men and, and so uh, I was in my mind at least I, was, I didn't have a seat in the military as a career and uh, was PE required PE was required but as a football and you know the, I had the practice time counted as PE for me so I got an A for one hour of PE <laughs> for that so yeah if you, if you didn't take ROTC you had to take PE Swimming and such. Yeah, swimming, bowling. Uh, they had a number of different things. Archery. Um, I did that, and then I did a wrestling uh, class. And uh, so I can't remember now. I think it may have been one of your first two years or something that you had to do it. But anyway, I, I was able to get through the PE stuff. Okay. Do you have a favorite memory from that time period? Well, let's see. Besides meeting your wife. Yeah, I say that's I always got to go first. But uh, see, that first time we met, I mean, I, I didn't even see her. I didn't notice her. But, um, but I guess from our first date. But um, you know, I I guess uh, really the uh, the experience in the fraternity. Uh, it's hard to pick one thing out. It's really more you know just. Uh, the complex web of it all, and you know the friends. I mean, I'm, you know, I have friends that I have. I mean, that I do things with today. I mean, I went. We had one of the, the guys in my class uh, for dinner at the Chef Series last week. You know, and so it's you know just like seeing somebody you just you know five minutes ago, and it's all uh, just so close. And you know, there's um, guys that I go to the NCAA wrestling tournament with that from you know from that year back then. You know, so we're, uh, you know, you really do connect for life, and that's uh, all uh, very positive. I mean, I, you know, if you just, you know, picking one moment, I mean, I, I guess it'd probably be uh, one little short period of time was when we did a goal line stand against OU here in 1960, 66, 67, in, uh, in 1967, I think about this. Yeah, it would have been 1966. In the fall of 66, we beat OU 15 to 14, and we had a four-play goal line stand to keep them from scoring. They were on the goal line, which is like just like you know one, one or two yards. And four times in a row, we stopped uh, their running back and won the game. So I was and I was down there on them you because know, I worked for the team. I could go. I, just, I went all the way down to the goal line and was you know standing there, you know cheering and everything, and then. You know, jumping up and down and all that, so yeah, that was a pretty exciting moment. Well, you remember that pretty clearly. I do, I do very clearly, yeah. So in terms of a, just a single memory, that might be it, but, uh, but it probably, like I say, but I, but the whole experience was probably the, you know, the best memory, I guess, I have. It's just that, you know, having uh, such good friends and, and uh, you know, people who supported you, uh, that you, you know, could have fun with, uh, that you respect, admire, uh, all, of, all of those things. All of those things came in handy for the application too, then. Right? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Back around to five eighty seven. Yeah. Do you think that you happen to have that email from President Hargis? On uh, when uh, you found out that we were recruiting as a kid? 
Um, you know, I may not have it, but uh, let me look and see. I think it. I think that's. I think it was an email. I won't swear to that, but let me. Uh, there was an email, and I think it was from him. But let me look back and see. I know it was about when that was. That was in August of 2012, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah. So I might have things that far back. Well, I don't. The historians ask. Right. Yeah. I understand. Sure. Well, let me look and see. I'll, I'll check, Charles. Yeah. I think that's it. That's I've kind of you very much. talked to you guys here, so I'm sorry. No, you've, uh, you've been great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's kind of nice to go tripping down memory lane here. Yeah. <laughs> go folks. Go folks is right. <laughs>